good morning or good afternoon. Um, first, I just want to say what a real pleasure it is to be here. This is definitely a little bit outside my wheelhouse, as um, was just said. Um, I do very theoretical work, and um, this was a nice opportunity for me to sort of connect with some of the sort of more practical things going on around me. So what I'm going to do during this um, brief talk is try to just outline sort of the scope of things that we're talking about, but also try to um, emphasize a few of the developments that are coming and where, even as a theoretical physicist, of course, we're often interested in simulating data. We're interested in how experiments are simulating their systems. We want to understand them better. And this is going ahead of, its, ahead of itself, I think. OK. So I'm going to just start off by just talking a little bit about scale. Because I think when we do simulations, it's often really important to, to focus on that, to think about what is the scale at which we're looking. Um, generally here, I'm meaning actually size. But in physics, we're thinking about energies, sometimes about momenta. We can be thinking about different things. And, and sort of the laws of physics, how you approach the problem, what are going to be the rules that you design into your system will depend on what scale you're looking at. And um, you know, my first book was called Warp Passages. It was about extra dimensions in particle physics. And one of the really interesting things to me was that even people who really appreciated it and really liked it, as even the particle physics aspects would be like, but that's not real, is it? Because it's not a scale that they see in their daily lives. I mean, we are very much um, prejudiced by the scales that we encounter. And what is amazing is that things can be very different on all these different scales. And I think one of the beauties, I imagine, of having virtual systems ultimately is going to be making those, those scales more familiar to us so that they don't seem so foreign. You can imagine yourself embedded in another scale. So I, I just love this quote from a Suzanne Vega um, song. I don't know how many of you know her. But, um, but and what's so small to you is so large to me. It's the last thing I do. I'll make you see. And I think that's what we're trying to do in science. It's what we're trying to do when we're writing books about science. But I think it's literally what you guys are trying to do. So I'm just going to start with a picture. Um, someone actually mailed this to me. Um, it's a picture from when I was in Paris. And um, you see the Eiffel Tower in the background. You see an am amazingly uncrowded street for Paris. Um, you see the kiosk with a, with a poster. It's all very familiar. But what I want you to think about when you look at that picture is that the scale at which you look at it or anything in our daily lives matters. How you're going to describe it, what you're going to see, what you're going to describe as the relevant laws of physics, it matters what scale you're observing it at. So if you, you know, the scale we just saw was a scale where we sort of see it as a structure. But if you looked very close, the scale would be small and you wouldn't necessarily see the entire structure. You would, however, see um, the amazing iron grid and the amazing um, metalwork that goes into it. You see something very different. And of course, if you probed even deeper, you would get to know the structure of the atoms. What you see really depends on your viewpoint. And of course, if you're too far away, you don't see it at all. And it sounds like such an obvious point, but we often miss that when we think about the world and we think about science. All the things that we are, could be there that we don't see because we don't yet have the resolution to observe them. So by increasing our resolution, we can encounter things that we never saw before. And with simulations, we can imagine what the world would be look like at those scales. What are the possibilities if we have a hypothesis for what, we can be, what it could be? And how those interactions would work together at those small scales, perhaps to provide what we actually see on the scales we encounter in our daily lives. But I confess the real reason I love that photograph is because uh, this is blown up, which is why it's low resolution. But I wrote uh, a libretto for a small opera that premiered at the Pompidou Center. So my name was actually on that poster. <laughs> <laughs> but to continue, I d again, I think you heard this in the um, last talk in many ways. But it, I, we really can't emphasize enough how our intuition is so much guided by what we observe and our physical theories, which is great for those of you who are innovators, because it means there's plenty of room for opportunity. Simply by getting outside the reference frame that we're familiar with, you often encounter new rules, new ways of looking at things, new approaches. Um, even um, 
you know, I'm doing a freshman seminar where we talk about quantum mechanics. And, you know, even if you wanted to see an atom, you can't see it. The wavelength of light is determined by an atom. You need other ways of approaching things and other ways of looking. And I'll be talking a little bit about that in this short talk. Um, and, of course, I just want to emphasize that the physical universe as we know it involves a much greater range of scales. So let's just take a very brief tour to get an idea. Okay. So we're going to start by first considering small scales, okay? So here, what do we have? Well, here, what's really interesting to a physicist about small scales is that if you get to small enough scales, the actual laws of physics that you would use to describe things change. Does that negate the laws we use on the scales we're familiar with? Of course not, Those, but they, we recognize them as an approximation. And in particular, classical mechanics is an approximation to what you would see if you could really probe down and see things at the atomic level, or even if you could um, make things faster, you'd see relativistic stuff. We see things moving slowly compared to the speed of light and at relatively large scales compared to the size of an atom. And that's why we were not aware of many of the phenomena that happen at small scales until we developed the tools to look at smaller scales, to really be able to probe inside. And that's how we discovered in some sense, that's how we discovered the atoms, although you could argue that that was somehow through atomic spectra, which were on um, different scales. But it's certainly how we discovered the nucleus, the fact that an atom was not just the plum pudding model of an atom, which, of course, no Americans really know what plum pudding is. But, um, but it actually is electrons going in orbits around a central, very dense nucleus. Okay. So what I, I start off this, this um, slide, and this slide, note, it goes from one meter which is basically a human scale, despite the fact that Americans refuse to use the metric system, um, down to the Planck length, which is an extremely small length, which might actually be the ultimate length scale that's even possible. That sounds crazy, but it's such a small scale, we would never resolve it. And it's also a scale at which gravity and quantum mechanics both come into play. So we don't even know in principle how we can explore a smaller scales. But at a meter, we're very familiar, we know what's going on. But I start this slide actually talking about some biological things, not physical things, to emphasize that even to know how our own body works, we didn't just theorize about it, we actually had to cut things open or develop tools to look inside. So to discover Harvey discovering the circulatory system, he had to look inside and see arteries and veins and a pumping heart. Um, red blood cells we found when looking under a microscope. And even DNA, of course, was found via X-ray diffraction. I always um, laugh that physicists are very bad at selling how m big a role they also play in medicine, because basically every diagnostic tool you have um, relies on aspects of physics. Um, but then we could go down to even smaller scales. And at even smaller scales, we get down to quantum effects, and we get down to the atom, hydrogen and atom being the simplest. Um, then we get even smaller scales, and that gets into the realm of the kind of physics that I do. Um, particle physics, where we're trying to understand the elementary particles at the heart of nature, which includes electrons, it includes quarks inside protons, but it also includes heavy quarks that we don't see da in daily lives that decay into them. How do we know about those? Well, we've actually built, we collectively as a human race, have built colliders where we can create high energies in such small systems that we can make new particles, particles that have heavier masses than the ones around us in our daily lives, but ones that last long enough that we can observe them through really impressive feats of technology, and I'll tell you just a little bit about that later through a video. Um, but one of the, the, the forefront energies today is the energy being per, um, observed at the Large Hadron Collider, which corresponds in distance scale to a scale like 10 to minus 17 centimeters. So a distance far smaller than anything you'd actually measure with a, with a measuring stick. But we can s translate that energy into physics at that tiny distance scale. And that's the limit of experiment, but it's not the limit of what we can think about. And certainly, people have gone on to think, of it, including myself, about much smaller scales and what the implications would be. So I'm just going to show you right now just a couple of examples of things happening at smaller scales um, of more and less relevance to the kinds of things you might think about. So the, um, this is, of course, just hidden structure in the atom, which we already mentioned. And the fact is that when we probe at smaller scales, we get down to the quark level, and we're trying to understand things at that quark level. But I also want to show you um, a few um, slides I got from Ed Bo Boyden, 
who's a, a neuroscientist at MIT. Um, he studies the brain, and so I'll just have this run through this video. So the point is that you can go inside the brain and find hidden structures. And those hidden structures are just inside our own heads. It's made of 100 billion neurons inside the brain. And um, these neurons interact to form, how did that get to there? That went way too fast. Um, but anyway, those neurons interact um, to form structures like memories and thoughts. Um, but what I wanted to show also is um, he has this idea of, or others too, advanced treatment for neurodegenerative diseases using opsins, light-sensitive um, molecules that can enter into the brain and so, and by doing so, you can control, you can turn on by varying the light, which neurons you're turning on. So you have a way of addressing these diseases, possibly in ways that have never been considered before. I'm not, I'm not vouching for any of my colleagues' uh, ultimate results, but I just think these are actually very interesting ways to think about things and undeniably very cool videos. Okay. And so this is a form of gene therapy. Okay. So I'll just let you see that opening up and letting things in. And that um, flashing thing that you saw a moment ago had to do with those various neurons lighting up. Okay. So that's what we saw a minute ago, just the various neurons lighting up, which is very, a very cool idea. Okay. But I also just want to show you this um, video from the Large Hadron Collider, because it really is amazing um, what's going on there, and just the scale, the technology that's gone into developing this. The technology in terms of magnets, the technology in terms of precision measurements, the technology in terms of actual data analysis. Um, you know, it's often neglected that, of course, the um, internet grew out of CERN because there were many people in different countries that wanted to work together on the same experiment in a practical way. And that's why it first got developed, the idea of having this. Um, and this is just showing the many stages that the protons go around before it goes into the final um, very large um, tunnel through which protons go to get accelerated, okay? 27 kilometers in circumference, okay? And right now there's talk about building a bigger one. We don't know if we will, but it'd be very cool if we did. So this is just basically going through all of these different um, levels. We don't need to see all of it, but I just want to emphasize um, that it's this huge operation, involves thousands of people working in coordinated efforts to examine billions, literally billions of events happening per second. So what happens is those protons collide in regions that, where they build experiments, and they build these experiments around those regions so that they can measure all the detailed properties. And you're looking for extremely small effects. That little bump is actually the Higgs boson. And to do that, you have to understand extremely well, not just what you expect to see, but what is the, what's called the background, what was there even if your thing wasn't there. And so these simulations are incredibly important in doing any sort of particle physics because without that we would never know what we expected because it's just too difficult to compute by hand. It's really literally involving one out of a billion events to find the Higgs boson. But that was small scales, but as physicists we also have the luxury of studying large scales. After all, it's one universe, the same laws of physics should apply, and we get to think about matter, not just the matter that we see, but also things like dark matter, matter that interacts gravitationally like matter, but it's invisible to our eyes. Why do we care about that? As I'll argue, it's critical to the structure of the universe. But I just want to emphasize that there's also, that we really are at some random scale. We're a meter, we can go up to scale, the scale of the universe, um, which is many, many times greater. And when I say the scale of the universe, you might be saying, how do you know the universe is finite? I actually don't. All we know is that there's only a finite realm of the universe we can see because the speed of light is finite and because it's lasted a, a fixed amount of time. So when we say the known universe, that really means the observable universe. The, and beyond that, we can speculate, and we do. <laughs> um, but we have the known universe. Then within it, we have all the structures that are of interest to us, why do I care about these structures? Well, as a fundamental physicist, I like to study fundamental things, but the fundamental interactions ultimately determine what these structures look like. So by, we're getting to the point now where by doing simulations, by having data, we can really do things at a level where we can begin to probe the fundamental interactions of things that we don't even see, like dark matter, to ask, are they compatible with the structures we see? And can they even explain things that are not 
consistent with their conventional models. So here, too, I'm just going to show you a couple of delightful videos. This one is from something called the Illustrious um, Collaboration. Um, what you see here are dense filaments that come because structure is forming. Um, this structure forms because dark matter is actually five times as much energy in dark matter as ordinary matter. Um, at some point, it takes over what's going on in the universe, and it actually collapses. It collapses, it takes ordinary matter along with it, and when it does so, it forms structures. Those structures, um, you have over densities and under densities, they intersect, and those intersections become these nodes, and those nodes become where galaxies form. So in this case, it might <laughs> seem that we look under the lamppost when we look at structures, because obviously we can only observe visible light directly, but that visible light has come along for the ride, along with the dark matter. So in general, when we see galaxies, they have both matter and dark matter in them. The part that we see is often the matter, but the part that we don't see, which still is exerting gravitational influence, is, is the dark matter. And as one of the things that I, as a particle physicist, study is what dark matter could possibly be and how we could possibly know what it is. And one of the key things that we do in order to understand that is, in fact, to observe structure in the universe. Um, the next slide is an example of such a structure. It's actually um, a galaxy being formed. And what that galaxy will look like, whether there are streams of matter, what the densities might be. Um, my last book, Dark Matter and the Dinosaurs, was about the possibility of having a disk like the Milky Way disk that sits in the center of our galaxy. These things are being studied, again, in great detail. There's something called the Gaia satellite that's studying a billion stars in the Milky Way. So we're really getting a lot more information about these things. So these detailed studies make a lot of sense. Okay. So that's kind of a little bit of a very brief overview of the kinds of things I think about. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of practical applications that my physics colleagues have been thinking about. Um, of course, pure science leads to advances, but we can't emphasize enough there is very rarely a direct line between these abstract theoretical ideas that we have and what actually goes on in, in to, as practical applications. You can try to make practical applications, but often it's good to just have free-floating thinking too. But these are cases where there's a little bit of convergence possibility, and, um, and it's really interesting to think about it, and of course, leading to the many themes, really interesting themes of your conference. So one is, um, has to do with alternative energy sources. Um, the reason I mentioned this one is actually Carlo Rubia, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, maybe many of you heard of, actually just came and gave a colloquium at Harvard um, about this very thing. So he's become interested in um, something called methane cracking. Um, again, I don't promise that any of these methods are actually going to work and be energy efficient in the end, but it's a really interesting idea to try to take methane, turn it into hydrogen, and also something called black carbon. So rather than just releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, to have something called black carbon. So it's to minimize the carbon footprint in energy. Um, it's not necessarily energy efficient yet, but they do have operating examples of it. And that's quite interesting. Um, and by studying the laws of physics at smaller scales, you know, we, we do get to understand things about what's going on. And this is done through heating. With an, there's a nuclear reactor involved. So it's some place where... Um, the expertise of a particle physicist can actually help in terms of developing the system. The next one is just something, um, uh, sorry, that's Harvard, uh, <laughs> the physics of graphene. Um, I have a colleague, Tim Caxiris, who, who more or less did uh, theoretical things, but worked with some experimenters and is still working with them, and found some really interesting results about graphene. Um, so graphene, again, is, it's a new material, which is why I thought relatively new material, or at least they're the applications of it certainly are, are new. And it's one of the reasons I wanted to mention this. Um, and it was discovered only in 2005. And it's interesting because no one actually thought it would exist. Um, um, it, it wasn't even seemed to be possible. So carbon atoms are arranged in a hexagonal pattern. Um, and what's really weird is that they form these bonds, which allows them to travel basically as if they're massless, which is um, very weird. And electrons travel in momentum space which is what's shown on the right. Okay, so that's a, that weird graph. I mean, one of the things you can do with simulations is you can plot whatever variables you want. It doesn't have to be space, and that's actually momentum space. Okay. Now, what was thought about was this interesting observation 
that you could have moiré patterns in twisted bilayer graphene. So in other words, by, if you had two layers of graphene and twist one with respect to the other, you could hope to find other structures. And in fact, that was done. There's a critical angle where you can rotate them with respect to each other. And you end up with this very interesting structure where you end up with different structures in the momentum space, these very small structures within the big structure. Now, why is that interesting? Well, it turns out that electrons get localized in this, at this magic angle. But electrons don't like to be localized, so they form structures. And that structure actually led to superconductivity at this magic angle. So they've actually discovered super, it's very low energy, but superconductivity with bilayer graphene, which is, of course, an entirely new phenomenon. Um, so now, um, I'm going to leave that. But I'm, I, oh, I forgot the, the nice uh, um, Wired magazine cover about tw something they call Twistronics. Uh, very clever. Um, but it is really interesting that there's this possibility of having this new kind of structure. And, and I just emphasize that because I think we are now, between methods, both in the laboratory and again, simulations, again, this was something that there was a theoretical idea behind it, but it's something that got materialized in a lab, but could be simulated. So it really had all these combinations of the kinds of things that can be done at a more or less human level at this time. Okay. So um, I'm going to now flip back to uh, things that I do. Um, I actually went through this even faster than I thought, so I can spend a little bit of time talking about the kinds of things I do. Um, so, one of the, so I like to work on things that relate to the observations we see today in general. But sometimes by thinking about think those different observations, we end up thinking about very theoretical questions, but in new ways, and new ways that give us insights we didn't have before. And this is just one slide of, of a topic that is the subject of an entire book and, and 20 years of research. But it's basically saying that if there was an extra dimension of space, a dimension beyond the three that we're familiar with, um, we could actually hope to have phenomena that we would not have anticipated just in our three dimensions. And this was something my collaborator, Raman Sundram, and I actually came across almost by accident. We found that if you had one extra dimension of space, you could have things where you would find very naturally that gravity, the strength of gravity in some sense, could vary exponentially as you went through another dimension. Um, this turns out to be relevant for a big problem in particle physics, which is essentially why masses we see are so light. Um, I mentioned the discovery of the Higgs boson um, in a previous slide when I talked about the Large Hadron Collider. A big question that particle physicists ask is, why is the Higgs boson as light as it is? Now, you might say it can't be that light. It took a while to find it at the Large Hadron Collider. But it's much lighter than what people would have thought theoretically it would be predicted to be. And so the question is, how is that consistent? If you do just standard particle physics calculation that combine together quantum mechanics and relativity, you expect it to be far heavier, orders of magnitude heavier, yet it's not. So I don't know if you followed the news on the Large Hadron Collider, but one of the things that's disappointed physicists is that they have not yet discovered the answer to that question. In addition to finding the Higgs boson, one of the things we very much hope to find was whatever theory it is that accompanies the, the Higgs boson and explains this question. And one of the things that Raman and I realized it could have been would be an extra dimension of space, which, by the way, is still a possibility. It's just the energy just might not yet be high enough to have found these particles. But in thinking about this very physical question that many physicists have been asking, we also discovered remarkable things, like you could have an infinite extra dimension of space and not see it. Most people had thought if there's an infinite extra dimension, gravity just dissipates away. But we found that you can actually have structures that localize gravity in ways that, in a region, you might see gravity even though far away you didn't, or far away it was weaker. So there really are new phenomena that you come at by thinking of these very physical questions. And right now, I'm thinking about a related question coming out of string theory, um, how you can actually explain what we see about extra dimensions today. Um, but like I said, that's somewhat more abstract, but it was related to particle physics. But because of all the available data and all the available simulations and all the available ways that we can actually numerically study this, I've also started thinking a lot more about things like dark matter and what kind of structures we can get with dark matter and how we can test these ideas. That's one direction. I'm recently thinking about dwarf galaxies, these small galaxies that can orbit in other galaxies or be on their own, um, what you can have there. But I also 
started thinking about gravity waves. Because I'd say that two of the major discoveries in physics of the last century were the Higgs boson, but also the discovery of gravity waves. So I'm going to um, show you a video of that, and then I will say a few words about that. So this is two black holes that are merging. And that is two black holes. And I, when I say two black holes, we're talking tens of solar mass black holes that are orbiting around, inspiraling, and then eventually merge together. Often people say they collide. They, you can call it a collision, but really they're merging into a single black hole. Now, the fact that we can observe that is amazing. It requires sensitivity um, beyond what anyone had ever anticipated was possible before this started to be developed. Now, the thing is that this is a billion light years away. It's very far away. So why do we see it? Well, why do we have even a chance of seeing it? Well, it turns out that when those two, the first two black holes merged, they were about 30 solar masses, and they gave off several solar masses worth of energy. That is to say, energy several times the mass of the sun. So even though it's spread out in all different directions, um, there's enough of it that reached here. Now, when I say it reached here enough, it was with an incredibly sensitive detector. This detector is called LIGO. There are two sites, one in Louisiana, um, one in somewhere else, um, <laughs> Washington State. Um, and, and basically, it's these, you see these two big arms. And what happens is laser light is sent down both arms. It can go back and forth many times. And then the way you test for very, very small deviations, and when I say small deviations, smaller than a proton size that are the result of the fact that a gravity wave went by. They can test for it by looking for interference. So these waves will no longer interfere the way they did before. So that's how they're building these incredibly sensitive instruments. And um, Risa wanted me to emphasize that with this kind of experiments, both at LHC and for gravity waves, you're, you're developing incredible de detector technology. You're developing mirrors um, that can reflect in ways that other ones didn't before, as is true for any kind of telescope. Mirror development. There's laser development. These things, again, have to be incredibly precise. There's engineering precision, novel materials, um, different ways of coding mirrors that work. So with these experiments, not only do we get to explore the universe in ways we've never been able to explore before, but we also de it requires development of technology. And one of the reasons I started writing books, actually, was because I often get annoyed when sort of theoretical physicists present it as just, it's all so beautiful. OK, we, we do think it's beautiful sometimes, especially after the fact. But it's also important to emphasize that these theories get developed concurrently with technology. And if you look through the history of science, technology gets developed, ideas get developed, and then those ideas foster further technology. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind. And right now, um, we're talking, there's talk about future gravity wave detectors. There's upgrades of LIGO, but there's also going to be, hopefully, something called LISA, unfortunately named, out in space, um, which will be able to study um, different wavelengths, even longer wavelengths. So it'll be able to catch black holes sort of earlier on or bigger black holes. Um, so, sorry. And also, um, we'll be able to um, perhaps make other ground-based gravity wave detectors. And there's lots of talk about what will come next. Um, so I just want to say that I think there's a role for, for simulations to be able to test precision ideas, but there's also a role for theory, because it gives you an idea of where to look, how to start, how to orient things in the first place. What are the things? Because when you have these big, enormous data sets, you often don't know what to focus on. So by having theory in mind, it gives you a, a target. It gives you something to look for. That's how the Higgs boson was discovered. That's how gravity waves were discovered. And you want to be sure you don't miss things, which is why when you're building these anyway, you want to have lots of theoretical ideas of what you can test. So I'm just going to end with one silly slide, um, uh, which is um, not this which is that I have uh, friends who work on Big Bang Theory. So I went, this was back when it was in, still on. And I was going to visit them. And they said, why don't you just be an extra? You could just sit in the lunchroom. And apparently, I'm a very good actor, because my directions were to sit in the lunchroom and be inconspicuous. And I, people didn't even realize I was there, even though I can, you can see I'm right behind them. <laughs> so, and this is why I like to think that the role of, of theory that you really, you have to tell people what to look for or else you will miss things. That's not to say you should only find things that you're looking for, but you have to be looking. So, thank you.